Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. We are your hosts, Dr. Scott Hoy, clinical psychologist, and Kyle Miller, licensed counselor. Psychology Talk is a unique conversation about psychology around the globe. We speak with psychology experts to keep you informed about current issues and trends. We advocate toward reducing stigma and educate about mental health. While you're listening, please take a moment to give us a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or your favorite streaming service. It helps us to continue providing you with quality programming. And now, enjoy the episode. Well, hello and welcome, everybody, to the Psychology Talk podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Henry Rohn. Dr. Rohn is the Vice President of Clinical Services at Elemy. Elemy is a behavioral health company that provides care for children with autism spectrum disorders, ADHD, and other issues that developed in childhood. Dr. Rohn received his PhD in psychology with an emphasis on applied behavioral analysis from Louisiana State University. His training and experience has included the John Hopkins University School of Medicine and the Marcus Institute Emory University School of Medicine. He's currently the Gregory S. Liptak, MD, Professor of Child Development in the Department of Pediatrics at Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York. We are recording this show in the month of April, which is Autism Awareness Month. So Dr. Rohn will be raising our awareness to neurodiversity issues connected with autism and in other areas. Dr. Rohn, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, um, you, you tell us maybe a little bit about yourself and, and how you found yourself in this, this position uh, working with uh, like behavioral issues in childhood. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, uh, thanks for the, the really nice introduction. First of all, that was, uh, Thank you. that was You're uh, welcome. really, really nice. Um, yeah, I, as you mentioned, you know, I've, I've, uh, been in the field for a little bit of time and throughout my career, I've, I've led the development of some fairly large clinical programs at academic medical centers around the country and, um, have really had the, the opportunity to start many of those from scratch. And so to really get on the ground floor and, um, take a look at really how we're developing systems and how we set up children for success in those programs. And so when I started working um, with Elemy, as, as this was probably two years ago as a consultant, it was really with the uh, opportunity to move beyond a regional focus and to have more of a national focus. And I, I think um, from my perspective, knowing that that we need to do so much more around helping families who are impacted by autism spectrum disorder, really being able to broaden that on a national basis and, and being able to apply my expertise and clinical skills to figuring out how we can develop a system that will care for more children more quickly has been something that um, really led me to, to work with, LB, with the LB team and has really been a, 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 fun, um, a fun process so far. Okay. Well, uh, what are some of the things you do with Alamein? Uh I, I oversee the clinical programs around ABA therapy and largely look at our clinical outcomes. So that's aspects of uh, really how we talk about behavior change, how we talk about symptom improvement, how we talk about um, our staff's ability to implement care in a consistent manner. And so really tightening up all of those quality measures and setting really guardrails around what we deem to be good therapy so that we can say, these are the results. We stand by this form of therapy and uh, can really demonstrate to uh, parents and caregivers that the outcomes are effective. Okay. And uh, well, some people in the audience might not know what ABA therapy is. Maybe you can kind of go into a little bit of that. Yes, I absolutely can. And, and, you know, I think it's important to realize that the way we talk about ABA therapy, the way we talk about autism has really um, evolved over time. And, you know, we've gone from talking about autism as being um, one of many different categories to talking about autism spectrum disorder. And then the term you introduced um, in, in your introduction was uh, neuro um, neurodivergence. And this neurodiversity. And 
I think it's it's just really helpful to to talk about those changes and ABA therapy because we've really seen both of those things change over time. Um, ABA itself uh, is is a field broader than just caring for children with autism. And so these behavioral principles are things that we all see in our everyday life. So principles like reinforcing behavior uh, is something that all of us experience, right? So praise to another person. Nice, nice job on the introduction today. That's an example of positive reinforcement. We, we all see these principles at play every day. But specific to, to autism therapy, um, applied behavior analysis really took hold in the 1960s and uh, very much as a, a kind of an alternative to your traditional behavior modification. And so, so behavior modification has traditionally looked at changing the way someone acts. And um, applied behavior analysis took it one step further to say, let's not just focus on why or the, at changing the way someone's acting. Let's focus instead on understanding the context and, and really the reason why the behavior is occurring and then learning about that from the individual's perspective to help to modify that behavior. And so, you know, certainly when we look back at the way things were done earlier in caring for children with autism, it, it's it's changed over time, just as the way we talk about autism has changed over time. Um, I started doing ABA therapy in the 1990s. I was trained by the group that was the major training center at the time in doing ABA therapy. And the way they trained me to do it was to speak to children in very short sentences um, very, you know, two to three word utterances to to prompt the child to do something to um, to kind of give a if they gave an incorrect response to give the very bland like no if they did it wrong and and that's just not if you think about it that's just not how children learn right we we like with your own children you kind of learn through interacting with them through playing through sharing through modeling behavior and that's really how um, how applied behavior analysis has really changed over time. It's definitely now um, we can look at the latest research. We can look at how you include things like um, engagement with a child, essentially playing with a child and use those opportunities for learning. Um, Very different than what was done um, 20 or 30 years ago, uh, but still staying true to those basic principles that are at this point um, about a hundred years old. So um, so we definitely apply that approach now across a, a range of behaviors associated with autism, particularly problematic behaviors like aggression. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, so basically you're, you're keeping an eye on uh, what's going on as far as, as the trainings, it seems like at uh, LME and, um, and the provision of services. Is that right? And, and also it uh, sounds like maybe data collection. If, if, if you, if LME is involved in any research or anything like that, or just looking for outcome uh, yeah. for what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Actually the field of applied behavior analysis is very data-based, but the, the database is always at the level of the individual. And so it's how is this child performing over time relative to where they were say a month ago? The field hasn't really developed uh, really well-developed outcome measures at a group level or really looking at predictive models of how children might develop over time. And one of the nice things of, of the work at LME is that we're able to take large amounts of data, cohort those data, look at them from the perspective of how does a typical child progress after X amount of time in therapy and actually start to then use some of our technology to develop some predictive models around that. And that's really important because that sets expectations for people, sets expectations for the child, for the family, for the therapists that are working with them, but also for the insurer. And so it it just really helps to move the field forward in a way that hasn't been done before. Okay. And and LME, you said, is is not just like specific to one community or, or one clinic. This is a nationwide effort. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Our clinical model is uh, really focused on identifying um, families who need care and getting their children into care more quickly. And one of the things that we do that's um, a little bit unique is we leverage technology to do that. And so 
Um, in a traditional ABA model, you would have um, a staff member who would work with a child. They would go into the child's home, say, five days a week. And you'd have a supervisor who would also go into the home periodically and maybe work with the parents or maybe supervise what the staff member is doing. And, and that model uh, takes a little while to get up and running because you have to find people who are in the client's area who can really you know, get to the client's home at certain times and all these things. We've been able to um, use technology to really get around some of that. Some of it is, is telemedicine-based technology. And so we have the, the more senior person who goes in periodically. That's done remotely. And it allows us then to uh, remote in where there might be a child in a more rural area where there wouldn't be a master's level clinician to provide care for them. Um, the other thing we've done that's a little unique is that we've developed a system to essentially create staff to go into the home and work directly with the child. And so we've used um, technology and kind of regional training centers to train these levels of frontline staff that work with children. They're called registered behavior technicians. And we found that when we train those people from scratch, when we, sorry, when we train those people from scratch, we do so at a level that is um, very similar to when we've got seasoned professionals working with us. Okay. Wow. Okay. So um, you're able to, to uh, really get in and, and help them with their skills building for uh, assisting the children and the families. So, so yeah, does that sure. include, and, in, does that include in-home care as well? Like actually? Um, absolutely. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's all, it's all in-home and, um, and, you know, we know from years of clinical experience that, that in-home care provides some pretty distinct advantages to, to being, taking a child to a clinic every day. And, you know, if you think about it, a child spends most of their life at their home, right? That's, that's where they have their meals. That's where they, you know, get, get showered in the morning, get ready for school. That's where they spend their weekends. And so being in the home in that natural setting really helps the treatment to take hold in that national setting. And it also fosters greater involvement of family members. Um, clinic settings tend to be pretty sterile environments. And so mm -hmm. when you train a parent in a clinical environment, you have to get very, very creative with kind of making the environment look like the home. And, and what we found through research is if you don't include those changes, um, then there's a higher chance of relapse or the treatment kind of falling apart when you go back into the home. And so working through the home to begin with really gets around some of those barriers and produces um, a, a decreased risk of the treatment falling apart, involves the family right off the bat, and, and really um, helps the child to, to essentially learn that whoever I'm with, wherever I am, kind of the learning opportunities and the quote unquote therapy will be implemented um, the same across all settings and all people. And that's really, really important for learning. You're standardizing it. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I, maybe what you can do is speak to what some of the signs and what we would call signs and symptoms of autism behavior is uh, in children and maybe even in adults and uh, how it can affect family systems. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, one of the things is that, um, so first of all, with, with autism symptoms, it's, there's kind of three categories. You have impairments in communication. And so that might look like a child not talking at an early age or not developing a full range of sentences. Um, you have um, deficits in social interaction that could look like not making eye contact with someone at a young age or not showing what we should call joint attention, where typically a parent and a child would both kind of look at something like, say, a balloon, and, and they might both say, oh, wow, look how pretty. Um, children with autism don't show that kind of joint attention, and they have that impairment in social um, social communication, social interaction. And then the third main categories of symptoms is, is repetitive and restricted behaviors. And so this can look like things um, such as hand flapping, body rocking, maybe having a very particular way that they um, structure their day or specific route that they like to take on the way to school. So those symptoms cluster together to yield the diagnosis of autism, but individuals can be impacted in different ways. And so for some children, it might be that they um, have very mild language impairments and maybe have a bit of uh, repetitive speech. 
Maybe they have difficulty making friends. Maybe they um, have a particular style or, or type of food that they eat, but they might be relatively mildly impaired. And then you have other children who might be completely nonverbal and have self-injurious behavior. And so it really runs that spectrum. What we've seen recently is an uptick in older individuals being diagnosed at an older age. We know from the literature that, that diagnosis can happen around age two, sometimes as low as 18 months, but diagnosis typically happens around four, four and a half, right? So people are kind of, children are getting diagnosed in early age, they're getting therapy at an early age, and that clearly shows the best outcomes. But what we also see is that now you're getting some adults who are starting to notice this thing called autism and they think, gosh, you know, that sort of sounds like me. And they might go for an evaluation and they might turn out to be um, diagnosed with autism. And what we've seen in, in the literature related to that is that many, um, many folks have developed um, ways to engage with other people that almost mask the symptoms of autism. Mm -hmm. And so they're not necessarily noticed. And so in a way, and, and maybe not even in consciously, but in a way you would have someone who has autism symptoms, but they've learned to kind of um, mask that in a social setting. And as a result, maybe the symptoms didn't quite show up throughout their childhood or throughout their college years. And then um, when they're an adult, they, they get evaluated and say, Oh, wow. You know, I, I kind of always felt like that. And, um, and now I know, and, and that's, huh. There's many, many examples of that actually in um, kind of the popular literature. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, mean, I, ass I assume that the more those examples become part of the popular literature, they'll be incorporated into the next DSM or, or ICD that we have for diagnostic would, criteria. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, that would be my thinking. Are you speaking more towards what we would call autism in women with the masking um, or is that something or is that something also that, that males do? Uh, males do it, yes, but it, it seems to at this thing at this point in the literature to be largely associated with um, with females with autism. Okay, and uh, I, I think that I assume that adults who are able, who are able to grow up masking those symptoms to socially function better or appear to uh, often wind up growing up feeling like aliens in a world that doesn't that they don't quite understand sure. and that doesn't quite understand them but also um maybe you could speak to levels of of functioning in the autism diagnosis i think there's like three levels that are in the dsm yeah, there's, there's three and they they generally align with kind of mild moderate and severe and so um and it it certainly shakes out to where the level of impairment does seem to be categorized across those levels and so someone with level 3 autism might involve uh you know they might be at a specialized school they might involve um respite care on the weekends whereas someone in level 1 or even level 2 might require some or no supports um socially um, in the environment um, but they might show different comorbidities as well. So certainly someone who has spent a lifetime masking their behaviors uh, and um, has engaged in social um, uh, you know, outcomes throughout their life uh, certainly might develop some anxiety around those things too, right? Always having to kind of be on their game and have some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, you know, um, anxiety about dealing with other people. And that, that's pretty common in people with, with level one or um, what's sometimes referred to as high functioning autism. Whereas with um, level three, the comorbidities might look more um, behaviorally challenged. And so certainly things like physical aggression or uh, maybe elopement or some of these other types of really dangerous situations come up. And that, that's not to say that those can occur with, with, you know, the other levels as well. Uh, it's just, um, we we set, we tend to see them kind of tracking different directions based on those levels. Yeah. Okay. Well, is it? I mean, I guess the reason. I mean, the the classic what you're describing is that level level three, right? Would be the classic symptoms that are easier to diagnose earlier on in life. Yeah, we we definitely see that, but you know, it, it's it's kind of this age old adage about autism, where if you've seen one individuals with autism, you've seen one individual with autism. And the point being that, that you know, the, the presentation of the clinical symptoms can look very, very different. And, and one of the things that, that I always tell people is that it's, 
you have to look at the child as the individual as, and they're as a unique human being. And they're not someone that, that needs to be changed or made to conform. And so you may have certain behaviors for one child that are, are really problematic, uh, but for another child might not be. And so what's, what's problematic for one child might be self-soothing for another child. Okay. And so what's really, really important is to look at it from the perspective of this is what makes the child unique. Which of those things that makes the child unique is a barrier for the child to living the most successful life they can. And, and how do you identify that? You, you know, sometimes you can ask the child, sometimes you can ask the child, but they may not be able to express themselves. Sometimes it might be the caregivers. It might be teachers, you know, it could be any number of other things, but then that drives the therapy approach. And so the type of therapy that someone with level one autism who um, has, you know, difficulty with social engagement, they might benefit from a group social skills instruction where it's other individuals and they practice engaging with one another, whereas someone who is more impacted by autism might need 20 plus hours of therapy a week to address uh, difficult behaviors, uh, making initial modeling uh, or imitating um, language. And so really it, it all gets back to the, the uniqueness of the individual and then structuring the treatment around that. Okay. Well, um, tell us a little bit more about like how um, the, the family is impacted by a child with uh, autistic behaviors. Yeah, I think, you know, for many parents, it, it's, it's just can be difficult for them initially to even imagine um, that their child can exhibit behaviors associated with autism. And, you know, it's certainly, I mean, we've run across parents before who um, haven't heard of what autism is. And so, you know, certainly it, it depends on how the family, um, how much knowledge they have coming into it. But it, you know, for any family um, of a child with any, any kind of special needs, the world that they move into with their child presents a series of challenges. And those are challenges that the, the family has to overcome. And they're challenges that put the parent in the position of being the main advocate for the child. And it, it ranges from where you get care in your area, how you get people to come into your home, how do you engage with the school, um, how are you going to afford it? I think these are all like really, really important um, problems for families to deal with. And so um, as a, as a care system um, and it's certainly within LME, we have to look at this from the perspective of how do we design care that minimizes the amount of, of struggles that the families have to deal with. And it is that, you know, so someone coming to your home uh, that certainly is, is easier in most cases, than having to get your child into a car and drive them across a big city. Uh, having a way to work with lower income families to get proper care without them going into debt and being able to provide that level of high quality behavioral health care for families um, that, you know, kind of historically has been, a, um, been offered to families who could afford it or families who have the right insurance plan. And so I think that providing that care and being able to do it at scale um, allows you to address the family's concerns because no child is prohibited from getting the, the level of support that they need. And that's something that ultimately just takes one more thing off of the family's plate that they have to deal with. So it sounds like uh, that, that LME's mission is really to help a broader range of people as well as being a nationally uh, oriented uh, kind of uh, go-to for this kind of treatment. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair. And, and, you know, one of the things um, for me that I think is just really, really interesting around um, LME is that when you, um, you know, we've got, we're bringing together people, from autism, best in class, you know, therapists who, who do this um, and have done this for years, really good, high quality training. But we're also bringing to bear on this problem, 
people from outside of healthcare. And I think when you when you look at something like autism care, to some extent healthcare in general, there's aspects of it that are very clearly broken, right? Or that that need to be fixed to an extent. And one of the really um, interesting things about this company is that we're able to um, take problem solving methods from things like Uber on how you assign drivers and identify drivers in different markets and apply that to how you develop and assign therapists to children with autism. And that kind of collaboration and that, that many kind of fields of, you know, whether it's public relations or, um, or product design or, or marketing or, um, you know, moving children through the healthcare system, that's never been done in autism care before. And mm-hmm. so to to move kind of beyond, I'm this clinician trying to help as many kids as I can, to I'm part of a system and that system is being designed and it's constantly evolving to to really modernize the approach that we're taking to caring for these children is, is really exciting. And um and being tech enabled behind all of that, um is constantly moving toward this notion of how do we do this better? How do we serve more children? How do we get them into care more quickly? How do children not have to wait as long? I think all of those things are really, um, really unique. And, and certainly um, for me as a clinician, um, thrilling, you know, it's, it's honestly it's very exciting to be involved in something like that, to think we're changing the way it's been done before. Cause you, you don't get many chances in life to, to, affect the level of change like that. So it's very exciting. Wow. Okay. Well, um, tell us about the inception of LME and like, and where it's going. Yeah, sure. We, um, so LME was, uh, started by, um, by, um, Yuri Kubit, who is a, um, a guy who really had developed some stuff around tele, um, telecommunications and hotels and, um, I think, you know, when I first met Yuri, he reached out to me because he said, you know, we're, we've kind of done these other things and we want to see how we can use technology to, to help children. And, um, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this, but he's, um, uh, Yuri received ABA therapy as a child. And so he saw firsthand that it was effective and thought, how can we make this work for more people? And so, you know, we certainly uh, have focused heavily on providing these customized ABA plans that can be um, administered um, in home, uh, delivered through telemedicine technologies. Uh, the company was founded in 2019, and so um, about about uh, um, yeah, just about three years ago, uh, we've certainly developed a system that I think um, investors find um, appealing. I, there's been about $323 million invested in this. Um, the investors range from uh, Bill Ackman, Chelsea Clinton, Ashton Kutcher to other investment firms. So it's, it's certainly a, um, something that I think a lot of people are seeing um, the efficacy of, but also seeing the potential and believing in the notion that um, this is the right way to, to affect autism care and eventually behavioral health care for children with other uh, mental and behavioral health needs. Okay. And so uh, we've been speaking quite a bit about autism uh, in lieu of the fact that it is Autism Awareness Month, but uh, maybe you could speak t- to some of the other issues that LME works with, such as ADHD or uh, yeah. oppositional issues or behavioral issues. Yep. Yeah, for sure. When, you know, certainly autism care is, is, is the main thing right now. And what we see with many children with autism is that there's a high rate of comorbidities uh, for things like ADHD, things like anxiety, and um, and to some extent, things like addictive behavior, because that fits into the ritualistic pattern of, of autism. And, um, and so kind of using autism as the jumping off point, we're now able to say, okay, how can we get into these other areas that are really affecting so many children with, with autism? And I will tell you, I, I have um, 13 year old twins and they are dealing with many of the same issues around mental health that, um, that a lot of kids are dealing with coming out of the pandemic. And yeah. so as a parent who um, is, you know, working on one hand, 
trying to impact care for the better for children with autism. But then on the other hand, as a consumer of a fairly broken system uh, with, with, you know, six month wait list, it, it's a pretty powerful thing. And I think as we started to have some success in autism, we started to say, gosh, you know, there's these other areas that these families are coming to us and saying, can you do medication management for my child? Because I, I can't get in to see a psychiatrist to manage uh, their comorbid anxiety. Um, the other one is, is diagnostics. You know, children have to wait six months to two years to get an initial diagnosis for something like autism. And that's just lost time. And so uh, looking at all of those problems and saying, okay, how do we now take what we've done for ABA? How do we, you know, modify it if we need to, or um, redesign it to, um, to be applied to some of these other conditions is, um, is certainly worthwhile. And, and that's what we started to do. And um, so far it's, um, it's looking really good. I mean, it's, you know, we certainly are starting to address things like ADHD, anxiety, depression, medication management, and um, we'll continue to do that. I think it's a, a really exciting time. It sounds almost like you're not really, it's not a clinic, but it's almost like um, a, a resource application or, or a, a you know, a hub for clinicians to work through. So uh, is that correct in my assumption? Yeah, I think that's a really good way to point it out. And and one of the things that, um, you know, just like I mentioned earlier, I learn a lot from my colleagues on the business operations side of things, where as a clinician, I wouldn't have had that access before. But I think as a clinician, you're able to learn about other forms of therapy and you're able to bounce ideas. And so it's almost like the, you know, the kind of notion of rounding on patients together, right. Where that we would have all done in training. Um, but now we can do that virtually. And when you're in an environment that fosters collaboration and fosters change and uses technology to, to make those things happen, it leads to a very creative process. And so you know, I when I first heard, for example, that we were doing diagnostics, um, I contacted the the psychologist who's doing the diagnostic program. I was like, "Tell me what you're doing. I'm really interested by this." And then she and I could bounce ideas off of each other. And if she sees a kid that they're diagnosed and has, uh, you know, severe uh, self injurious behavior. She can flag that back to me and I'm in New York. She's in Florida. We can still come up with a care model for that. And it really, uh, I think that system and being, being plugged into so many different clinicians is uh, just a really nice way. And, and you over time start to develop um, a really trusting relationship with the other clinician. And I think that filters down to the clients and their families. Okay. So they feel like they're actually having a big a team uh, is working to help out and uh, they're not alone in this and they're not just working with one person in an office or somebody coming to the house or the school. Wow. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and it's uh, quicker access, which I think is, is if you can provide quicker access with really high quality outcomes, that's a recipe for success for the client. No, the earlier, the better, I'm sure uh, yeah. with, with, with proper and, and excellent treatment. Um, are you working together with school systems at all? Or is that we not do. in the picture? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we do. We, you know, so many of the kids, especially around autism, it's extremely rare that a child um, that we see is, you know, school aged and not receiving school. Right. And so to, to not work with the schools, which is such a huge component of their lives um, is, you know, obviously you're leaving a big part out. Um, so we, we certainly work with schools. There, there are some issues around that, and it's kind of a state-by-state state thing with the use of telemedicine and, and some of these other things. I'm sure you can imagine um, that. But, um, but, you know, the treatment's only going to be as good as um, the people who have been trained to implement it. And so if you're leaving them out of the equation, then you're, you're selling yourself and the, the child short. And so um, – that's a really important part of it. The, the other thing that we've started to do is we found that about, um, about 75% of children with autism receive some other form of therapy. And so I think in a traditional ABA model, um, it was kind of like I do ABA and then other people do whatever they do, but there wasn't a lot of collaboration and, and that just doesn't work. I mean, it, it, it can work, but that, it doesn't work from the perspective of the family to have a, a disjointed care team for your child. 
And so we've started at LME to incorporate speech therapist into what we're doing as part of a team and occupational therapy into what we're doing, because all of that improves the level of care for the child. And so I think when you, when you look at how you would design a system as a best case scenario, that's something that this environment can kind of let us do, you know, I've, I've tried to do that in universities for years and it's kind of, well, the budget meetings in six months, let's, you know, meet again and see how that'll go. When you're in this kind of environment, you can test those hypotheses and you can evaluate what works best for the family. And I think that that leads to a lot of creativity, the kind of creativity you see come out of Silicon Valley around other things, but now that creativity coming to provide better healthcare. And so, you know, whether it's schools, whether it's OTs, whether it's diagnostics, ADHD care, all of those things work together and it's, um, it's really exciting. Well, yeah. And, and you use the word creativity. I think that's a huge part of what human beings really require in order to feel Mm -hmm. connected with whatever work it is they're doing or whatever, even if it's a hobby or an interest, right? I mean, there has to be some kind of like, a requisite variety of of of, of uh, stimulation and uh, feedback loop, like flow right. kind of feedback loop. So it sounds like there's a lot of that going on with an LME, which makes people excited about their work and will make them constantly try to do better and and work with the feedback rather than just kind of stagnating and 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 what they're doing. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you know, you you probably know this, but from your own professional life, but when you, it's easy to lose, to lose sight of that on a daily basis when you're in, you know, you're just in another meeting and we're just looking at a different table with some data in it. And you're, uh, but it, it's the whole of the organism that comes together to affect hundreds of children at a time. And I think yeah. to me, that's, that's what's um, really beyond the meetings. Right. And so, you can see the direct results. And and with one of the things that I find really unique about um, LME is, is when I started, I sat down with, with Yuri, our CEO, and he said, spend time telling us what quality outcomes look like. And I thought that's really impressive because um, obviously, you know, you want to have growth of the company, but you want to have growth with quality. I think when the CEO leads with that, that sets the tone for the rest of the organization. And so we meet as a team from the whole company, leaders from the whole company meet weekly where I show that team clinical outcome data, right? To the engineers, these are the outcome Mm -hmm. data that we're seeing. The business team shows business metrics for the outcomes, but it's a completely transparent environment. And I think that leads everyone to understand these are how the different components work together to produce the whole And that leads to excitement too. And then certainly uh, the best excitement at all comes from when we hear patient success stories, right? So a parent uh, comes and talks to us or we see um, a session with a child where they're saying their first words. And that's where uh, the the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And you really see that the most exciting outcomes of all. So you're looking at not just quantitative measures, which of course, um, you know, (laughs) uh, data people will love and, you know, Scientists love that too, right? but but you're looking at qualitative. Like so, so, the family, the families who contact LME shouldn't be worried that they're going to be lost in a morass of uh, numbers and and uh, no. mechanical outcomes. There, there's a there's an actual connection between the caregiver, whether it's the ABA trained clinician or a psychologist or or whatnot uh, or medication management. Yeah. Let me ask you this. How, how is it possible for people to become involved uh, from the clinical side of things with LME? Is that, is that possible for people out in the audience who might be interested in, in checking it out or supporting you in some way? Yeah. I mean, I, um, I love clinical playmates. And so um, it's always <laughs> fun to, um, it's always I like fun that. to bring in people. I like that. People. Playmates. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I always yeah. tell people that I know how to do what I know how to do. And it's, but it's not everything. Right. And like, I don't, right. I'm not a speech therapist. Uh, I don't, I don't do family therapy. Uh, I don't, I don't deal with, uh, you know, we know the divorce rates higher among parents of children with developmental disabilities. Yeah. That's not, I don't, I don't do anything, you know, that's not my area of expertise. Um, and so from my perspective, 
you know, if this is almost like the fairy godmother coming down saying, design your optimal care program for children's behavioral health and what would it need? And, and I think, you know, you only, for me, any program development I've ever done, as soon as I finished the program development, I thought, oh, we forgot to do, you know, X, Y, and Z, right? And, and that's just the nature of the beast. But in this model, it's, it's just people are constantly ideating on things. And so I think from a clinician's perspective, uh, certainly reaching out through the LME website, um, reaching out to, there's a number of uh, folks in LinkedIn. If you just type in LME, find me, find a ton of other people. But it's really those connections because I think when we look to start a new line of of, um, therapy, looking at um, people to talk to us about what, what best practices or technologies they're working on, then it leads to some really cool creativity. And I think that's, um, I'm, I feel like I'm lucky to be a part of it. I think there's other folks that we've included who've been very lucky to be a part of it. And having other people um, get on board is just kind of a, a great okay. idea. I think it's something that's well, great. Well, that sounds like, like from a, a real, from the exciting creation of, of new, new or, or uh, development of new areas, like say, for instance, family systems with people with, uh, children with developmental disabilities or disorders. But uh, what about clinicians who just want to work with you, who just, who they want to represent, they want LME to be part of their, their team working somewhere in the field, like say in Wisconsin or in Illinois or California. Is that, is that a possibility? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have, we certainly have like right now we have core markets that we're in and then we have Mm -hmm. kind of developing markets that we're in. And so a lot of that is um, there's a you know a lot of different reasons why that is. Some of that is the number of care providers that we can that there are in different areas. Uh, so you know we have these these people who go into the home called a registered behavior technician, and they're supervised by a master's level clinician called a, a board certified behavior analyst. Sometimes there's more board certified behavior analysts in a state than there are registered behavior technicians, and so it's really hard to get things moving in that area to. Um, to create. Um, so, I, you know, in terms of, of getting involved in a new state, um, getting involved in a new line of care, all of that works through, um, through the, the core group of the company in, in terms of business development and the team that really looks at kind of um, new opportunities to um, do something unique in healthcare. And, um, and often on, the, like I said, on LinkedIn or either on the LME website, there's uh, posts for, what we're looking to do, uh, the types of hires we're looking to make. And um, it's, it's uh, quite a bit of visibility around that. Okay. So which markets are you in right now? So right now it's um, largely Florida, um, Texas, California, and then we have kind of a host of East coast and kind of Chicago uh, and some other areas that are sort of market four. And those are the ones that are in development. So we have three that are like really, up and running with um, you know several hundred children, and then the other ones are in different levels of emergence. Okay. Well, uh, we we did mention neurodiversity a couple of times. Can you maybe you can kind of talk to that as we wrap up here? What is neurodiversity, and how should we maybe use that as a term to look at things rather than um, disorders or or um, or whatnot? Yeah. I, that's a really important point because I think that we have to um, get away from that notion of um, of we're aware of a disorder. You know, I think like I think you led with this that that um, that April is is you know Autism Awareness Month, and um, we've started to refer to it as Autism Acceptance Month because it, of the broader okay. movement toward the neurodivergence inclusion and and folks being um, allies with us. And, you know, it, it goes beyond just kind of being aware um, and, and accepting because um, we don't believe that, that anybody, whether they have autism or, 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 or not, should have to seek the, the approval of other people. And, and I, I firmly believe that I, um, you know, I've got members of my own family who are, um, are, you know, in groups that um, have their own awareness or acceptance month. And, um, and I think this is the society that we live in, that we have to force people to feel like they have to be approved or accepted by other people. And, and so I, I 
personally believe that. I, I personally believe that we want to include people um, as we can. And, and I would just reiterate, we don't, I never set out to design a clinical program or none of our clinicians look to do therapies to say, let's teach this child to conform to the norms of the school or the norms of society. It, it is truly about let's do what we can do to have this child have the most success they can have the the family to have the most, you know, the best child rearing experience they can have. And all of those things get back to what are the needs? What are the needs of the child and how can we help you? And so, you know, if, if the need is learning language, if the need is stopping a problematic behavior, then that's to me, that's the focus more on, let's fix autism. And I, I think that's a, that's a, a bit of a paradigm shift. I don't know that, that people have always looked, I don't know that I've always looked at it that way to be quite honest with you, but it gets back to that notion of acceptance of, of individual uniqueness and, and instead focusing on what are the things that are really, um, you know, placing the child at risk of harm or, um, holding the child back in a way where we feel like we can help the family to to overcome this and help the child overcome it. And so we we firmly believe that to the extent possible, the child having a voice in therapy, stating their likes and dislikes, making choices about things, the family is an equal partner when we develop therapy um, goals. And so all of those things, I think, um, support that notion that it's a diverse group of people. It's a diverse type of therapy. And, um, and accepting of that and, and knowing that, um, that that's the case is, is the best way to, uh, I think, to move the field forward and to move care forward. Do you think that there's been more of a strengths and an emphasis on strengths of the, of the child and the strength of the person who might be more neurodiverse than others or might display what we would call autism? I think, I think so. I think you've seen that where people come and, you know, historically might've said, well, that person has autism. They, they need our help. And I think now you're seeing it a little bit differently where it's like, well, that person has autism uh, and here's the things that make them um, a really unique person and a, a, of somebody that really is, um, you know, we're, we're lucky to be engaged with. And I think that, all of, you know, all, I think all of us as human beings seek that kind of acknowledgement. Like this, is, you know, my name is Hank and this is the thing that makes me special. Right. Uh, and maybe some people, uh, I feel like I'm on the lower end of having things that make me special, but I think other people have a lot of things and it's, and it's understanding that and then looking at those strengths. And so whether, you know, that could be artwork, it could be just the simple um, level of unique engagement that a child has, but I don't know that I've ever met a child where I didn't think, wow, I've never seen a kid do that before. That's pretty cool. And I, you know, when you, when you use that as the basis of your, uh, of your therapy approach, then it, it starts to create a little bit of a different line of thought and, and a system change. Cool. Well, on that note, I think we will, uh, we'll sign off here. Thank you so much, Hank. Dr. Rowan, uh, for your insights and sharing with us, Elmi, and your insights on autism and uh, autism acceptance. Yeah, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to the Psychology Talk podcast. Did you know you can find us on the web all over the place? Well, maybe not all over the place, but you can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us at Spreaker, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, loads of places. Please look for us. And if you can, subscribe, like us, leave us a review, send us a comment, a criticism, Hey, we like to hear a lot from people. Go ahead, talk to us. That's why we're here. By the way, this is just a reminder to let you know that all of the material here is for entertainment and informative purposes only. If you do need a therapist or a mental health professional, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati. <laughs>